This week on the Backtable Podcast. Part of being one of these surgeon leaders is invariably, whether as an attending, people are going to come to you with a problem. Most every day when you're at work, people are always coming to you with a version of a problem, a problem with your patient, a problem with the staff, some version of a problem. And, you know, when you meet with your boss and he didn't know that I was going to then be with him, you know, I had, it was not a fait accompli that I would come back to Philadelphia. I wanted to look around, et cetera, et cetera. And it just made sense to come back. But before I remember him saying to me, he's like, people come to me with problems all the time. And that's okay, because that's why I'm here is to sort of hear about people's problems and try to get them better. But I will say that it's very uncommon for someone at the physician level to come to me with a problem and also present a solution. So just think about that was what he would say to me. And he would say, he would say, listen, I don't necessarily need to go with your solution, but the fact that you're offering a solution probably puts you a step ahead of a lot of other people that have come to me before you. And so I've always taken that. So to get to your point about how do you sort of climb administratively is I've always tried to look for the solution. And I've always tried to think about them before I've sat in that administrator's office and tried to present them with a solution. And sometimes they go with it. Actually, and over time, they will go with your solution more often. But in the beginning, I think they're just happy that you're thinking about the solution. And I think Rob was correct in that advice. And I've always tried to sort of follow through with that is look at the problems, try to come up with solutions. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Backtable podcast, your source for all things urology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. This is Aditya Bagrodia as your host this week, and I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, Jay Simhan from Fox Chase Cancer Center and Temple Health. Jay, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Doing great, Aditya. Thanks for having me. It's so exciting to be here. Yeah, no, I'm I'm thrilled, Jay. So brief history, Jay and I overlapped for a year. It was a very memorable year during Jay's fellowship at UT Southwestern. Great chemistry. And it's totally been a fun ride to see your meteoric career in Philly. And as we were kind of brainstorming topics, I mean, there's so many areas of expertise, you know, non-narcotic based pathways for recon patients, stricter disease, prosthetic urology. You had possibly mentioned a non-medical topic of showing value in your first job, and I think it's perfect. So let, let's just jump into it. No contract signed, show up, or I say show up day one, but even pre-show up. How do you start kind of setting setting the tone for a, for a successful first stint? Well, you know, I I think you're right. I mean, we were talking this through, and. Now I've, I've sort of gone through these various years of residents that graduate, now fellows that sort of come through, and a lot of them end up asking me about their first job. And they ask me sort of, well, how did you sort of get started? And what did you sort of reflect on? And, and so uh, not to say that I'm an expert in any of this, it's just more how I've thought about it and sort of my perspective on it. But I don't know. I mean, I, I think before you show up, I think the thing that you have to sort of remember is... What you went through when you were deciding on that position. So for a lot of people, when they go through, whether it's a private practice job or a sort of super academic job, there's ultimately a contract negotiation, right? So you're going through a version of there's my, maybe not a lot of negotiating or maybe there's a lot of negotiating. But ultimately, the people, when you, when you sort of start your first job, I at least try to remind at least the trainees that we we have going through right now, however great you think you are, you know, there's there's so many great people in urology. There just are. There's so many great graduates, there's so many great residencies that put out great trainees year over year. So urology, I think, is synonymous with excellence, right? Like when you're an intern on general surgery, at least when we were training, now it's all on urology, but when we were training, we were seen as really the cream of the crop when we were in general surgery. And that's for good reason, right? Urologists are really sort of carefully vetted. 
And it's like a team that we, we sort of bring people in. So when you're now looking for a position and when you've finalized that position, you've conducted yourself in some sort of way to get that position. In that sense, a good way because you've landed the job. So when you start your job, you have to remind yourself that really you're entering into an environment where people have likely equilibrated you know, or equated urology with excellence. So you have to just remind yourself that, listen, you know, you're joining a team likely, whether it's academic or private, you know, most people join a group now of some sort, you know, that group is likely going to be well regarded by the, the environment that you're joining. So you have to then sort of ask yourself, how can I sort of start that position such that I don't bring down the stock of not only myself, but of the people and or the team with which you're sort of joining in. I don't know if that makes sense fully. It totally does. And, and maybe I'll just share a couple of thoughts. So, you know, I trained as a resident at UT Southwestern. I went to Memorial, then I was coming back. And, you know, the fact that I was offered a job at such a esteemed department was like mind blowing. And I get a contract letter. And the first thing was like, well, this seems totally reasonable, totally fair, you know, even let's just sort of like salary. I was like, well, do I want to ask for anything? Like the last thing I want to do is seem like needy or, you know, rub Klaus the wrong way. The and wrong way. That's right. Of course, I was professional, et cetera, the whole whole way. But, but you're absolutely right. I mean, when you're starting, if you come across as difficult to work with or challenging or whatever, that's an issue. And then the second bit of it is when you join a place that's excellent, I think it's normal and healthy and expected to have a bit of a complex. That's right. When I joined UT Southwestern, I was like, oh my gosh, like how do I show up with just superstar after superstar and, and how am I going to carve out my niche and represent myself and my department well? So it's, I think it's normal to have these kind of emotions. I mean, you go back to a place with Bob Uzo and Kudakov, you know, mentors, and, and it's got to be a little bit intimidating, a little bit overwhelming that you've gone from a trainee to a partner. Oh, it's super intimidating. No question. And, and I totally can relate to all of what you sort of went through coming back to Dallas, you know, for your sort of first spot right after Memorial. And I can relate to all of that, you know, and coming back to Philadelphia and I would say to your point about contracts and how you conduct yourself, I, I say this often to people, at least how urology and the business of medicine, I think, function right now is it's very uncommon to be participant in a contract conversation that solely resides, the decision making of that contract solely resides within a urologist per. There's almost always a business person that's involved in that conversation. There's almost always, whether it's in a private group or in an academic group. And I would say that generally, and this is like, you know, very tough to speak in specifics, but my general sense in this is that when you make, not you in particular, that you would never do this, but if someone were to make a very big deal about themselves and or their self-worth at that very first contract conversation, Regardless of how great Klaus knew you to be, or, you know, in my case, Uzo or Kudakov, those guys might have sort of taken me to be, there's always someone else that's sort of weighing in on that contract. And I always tell people that person is always going to not necessarily undervalue you, but they're not going to understand how great you are, even though your mentors might say how great you are to that person. So you're going to have to go to that job. And I hate to say it, earn it. You're going to have to sort of earn it. So I always at least give the advice that in the first position, you actually lose a lot by making a big stink over contract and or negotiating various sort of levels of your asks per se for a highly coveted jobs or a job that you really want, because ultimately when you start in the position, getting back to really how we just started chatting about this, that other person who you have no idea who that person is, you know, Klaus may know who that is, or Uzo may know who that is, but that other person, they're paying attention to your beginning steps in your first three months, six months, nine months. And you would hate to have a scenario where if you don't get out of the gate the right way, that person is reminding Klaus, 
well, why did we bring Aditya on? Do you know what I mean? And, and that would never happen with you. That would never happen. But it's just an, an example of how I could sort of see that playing out. I think every department now, they're co-managed by administrators and urologists. And so that administrator, you need to sort of remember that they're always in the background there sort of assessing people's worth. Yeah. So you show up. We try to make it a positive process. And whether that's with the new group, a private group, an academic group, and you're there. And this is a perspective. I mean, clearly people are hired in different roles, but I think 101, if you're taking care of patients, it's got to be, you know, setting the tone that this is a clinically and surgically very competent urologic surgeon. I mean, it's, it's more than that, right? It's not just doing that, but making sure that that's communicated to key stakeholders, that's observed within the ORs, within the clinic, that's conveyed to referring providers. So maybe walk us a little bit of through that, the nitty gritty of those first three months. I mean, reflecting back, recognizing it's been a little bit. I mean, the way I think about it is it's really like anything, right? So some of this is related to maybe starting a new fellowship or residency, but it's like that on steroids when you start as an attending, right? Because there's so many parties that you have to try to learn, and then you have to try to sort of earn their respect. So you're learning who they are, and you're trying to earn their respect and also demonstrate that you're capable, right? And so that extends from, if you go to an academic program, a certain degree of that extends to the residents even. The trainees are a constituency, there's your partners who you may know some of them because that might have been how you got into that position. In other instances, you might not know anyone in the group. There's, of course, the sort of support staff, the nurses, the MAs, the front desk staff. If you have a secretary, your secretary. And then there's this for us, you know, most of us sort of get out of training and we operate, you know, so we're in the operating room, whether whatever field you're in, generalist all the way through super subspecialized. And then there's this whole arena of people in the operating room that you have to sort of recognize. So I think the first step here is recognizing all of these various constituencies. I think that's the first step. I think the next step is, like you said, building your own sort of cultural philosophy of what you stand for, because I think people are paying attention to what you stand for, how much you care. I hate to say it that way. It's like the simple things how much you care, how available you are. The three A's that, you know, I, I think was brought up in a previous conversation. It's like the three A's they talk about for those listening who may have heard this already, but for some of you who may have not, you know, there's this sort of available, affable and able mantra that people talk about. And I would honestly say that the ability, so able, which is the third one I just mentioned, is probably we want it to be the most important. But I think when you first start, it's actually the least important, I think. I think it's the least important because your sort of affability and availability, fortunately or unfortunately, probably are more heavily weighted in that calculation because everyone recognizes that you're the new person. And so those two don't, shouldn't come with that much prompting that you could be sort of an available person because you're brand new. And or you can be a very sort of affable person, you know, just someone who's easy to talk to. And I don't know if you have any sort of stories about that when you first started in Dallas. Well, yeah, I think being approachable, I mean, certainly on the academic side, when it's easy to be a step removed from people that have been in practice. But these are all, again, like highly accomplished people have been through a residency and, you know, maybe their life goals aren't the same as ours, but able to have a conversation, not make people feel alienated. That's massive. I mean, my kind of clinical and research area is testicular cancer. And, you know, you better believe if I got an orchiectomy or an RPLND, that patient was getting a phone call. It's a bit of a challenge to call their office, leave a nurse, but hey, I saw him. Thanks for sending it. You know, here's what I'm doing. Here's my thoughts involving them. So I think I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, it's, it's a bit of a stretch to kind of if I had to put in a fourth aid, it'd be accountability, take ownership. I mean, stuff's going to happen. You don't try to punt this off on the patient was obese or blah, blah, blah. You know, when you're new, I think 
it's okay to not have the answer to everything. You know, find your your mentors, whether they're at the same institution or another institution. That's right. Run by complex stuff by them. Like nobody's looking for, you know, a cowboy time point zero. <laughs> and some of this is lessons learned. Yeah, but no one no one's figured it all out, right? No one no one starts medical school, for example. And, you know, these people who sort of in med school, I remember there were people who are like just they were so knowledgeable. And I remember asking someone, I was like, how did you actually know that? They're like, well, I read. Do you know what I mean? Like I like, you know, you prepare <laughs> and it's like, right, oh, right. OK, like, you know what I mean? Like in college, I feel like there was a lot of things that just you didn't need to necessarily prepare for certain things. You know, it just sort of might have come naturally to you. But there was no way that you were going to magically understand human anatomy unless you actually studied it, you know, and I feel like that part of it in urology, we do well, you know, we're, we're sort of, we're very good at preparation. And this is something where we can prepare to be successful in that first position, like you said. And, and so some of it, I think, is relying on your mentors. Some of it is sort of these three or four A's. Accountability, I think, is huge. I think, you know, some of it probably has to go towards people want someone who believes in what they're doing. Now, let me explain that. So when I when I first started, I came to a system that really didn't do a lot of reconstructive urology. So that's sort of in my background and penile implants, for example. So I do a fair amount of prosthetics. And, you know, when I first came, like the hospital was like, wait a sec, you do penile implants? And I was like, yeah, you know, sure. And one, you have to sort of show the passion behind what you do for people to sort of want you to do it. And two, you know, the first thing I remember hearing was they're like, oh, well, we do a lot of penile implants too. And I was like, oh, that's great. And I find out later after that person told me that that whole year they had done six penile implants, that whole like preceding 12 months. So, you know, you have to sort of grow within them that when you do six, let's say in a week, they are going to look at that and be somewhat staggered by it. But for you to get to that number, a whole slew of people, your nurse, your office, the OR, like everyone has to basically buy into your operation. So some, I imagine in cancer, I mean, you tell me, I think some in cancer, it's such a, it, it's affected a lot of us. Cancer, the diagnosis of cancer has affected us either personally or a loved one or a friend has been affected by cancer. So the management of cancer is something where we're willing to put up with whether it's radiation, like chemotherapy or surgery, we're willing to sort of understand it. I think in some of these benign neurologic conditions, it's so new for certain people, for the OR or for your staff, you have to basically show them how passionate you are in that field of yours for them to then sort of buy in, especially if you're joining an area or a job or a market where that type of service isn't done in the volume with which you want to do it. Now, I don't know if that fully makes sense. What do you think? Absolutely. And even just unpackaging this. So, you know, we start our first jobs generally as trained in whatever we've decided to do, you know, general urology, if you're a resident or a fellowship, and then you get there and you're an expert, you're at the cutting edge medically and surgically of whatever you do. But even just unpacking this small example that you gave. So when you get into a place, you're a urologist, you're bright. It's well within your purview to figure out what's the lay of the land. Don't be intimidated. So just the fact that you figure out that the typical volume is six IPPs per year, you've done some intel. And yes, you're not the chairman of the department. You're not the departmental administrator, but you're not an idiot and you're not you know, basically removed from getting that information. So I say this because I think at well-run departments, these things are understood. You know, what are the, what's the population of Philadelphia? What's the breakdown between Temple and Einstein and private practice? How many prostates do we do? What's the incidence of erectile dysfunction? How many of these should be getting done and how many are we doing? That's correct. So I think, you know, for me, it was kind of basic and translational research. You know, I'm I had a background in that, but it's like, what's the funding available? How do you hire? How do you collaborate? And I guess it's, you know, don't sell yourself short. You figure out what it is that you're passionate about. I mean, in your case, it's clear that you're passionate about, you know, making sure that people are having an excellent clinical outcome, 
offering survivorship surgery to the people that require it. And for you to understand the issue, the growth capacity, how to do that, the marketing, that's what you've done. You know, you're right. You're totally right. You have to learn, I think, to summarize, and it's sort of coming to me as you're describing it, you have to learn the geography, the culture, fill in the blank, right? The geography, the culture, the mindset, the capabilities of where you're entering. So now sort of coming full circle, how do you start off in your first three months? You're spending a lot of time figuring that out. And you're spending a lot of time thinking about it, asking questions. And I hate to say it this way, but you don't necessarily want to tip your hand off either to the person you're asking the question because you don't, they don't really know you, you know? So, so when you're sort of learning how you fit in into the hospital system, health system, city, or region, you just want to learn because ultimately, for good or bad, there aren't enough urologists. So there is a role for you in the community with which you want to be in and the one that you're joining. So you have to learn to sort of fit into that role. Now, I heard you had a great podcast with one of my partners, Alex. You had mentioned Alex Kudikoff on adrenal. And, you know, adrenal is probably one of the only sort of areas in urology where so many other people claim that that's their domain, right? General surgery claims that's their domain. Endocrine surgery claims that's their domain. All these people sort of own it. Whereas in most everything else we do, we have sole custody over these things. You know, we, we really do. So to sort of learn who in urology has custody over those things is much easier than learning who outside of urology has custody in these things. Do you know what I mean? So to sort of get to your point, Aditya, I, I think those first three months, four months, I spent a lot of time just trying to learn the landscape. And the landscape was the landscape in my hospital, in the health system, but then frankly, also in Philadelphia. And so to use the penile implant example, there was one penile implanter in Philadelphia who was a solo private practitioner when I first started in Philly who did a lot of penile implants. And other than that person, there was really no one else that did that operation in measurable volume, in high volume. And I just saw that as, well, wow, like this is a major market and there is a huge need for like a penile implant surgeon in the city of Philadelphia. So that type of epiphany, I actually didn't understand that when I was a fellow. And when we were together, you know, when we crossed that one year, I had no idea to think about it like that then. I just came back to Philadelphia because like you said, my mentors were there and I wanted to be successful under my mentors. But thinking about sort of the geography, the culture, the capabilities of the city and or the needs of the city, that sort of thing only clicked within me as I started my position. And I would say to you, I would try to focus my first several months on that. Totally. So just some kind of comments and thoughts about that. It's hard to know what to plan for and how to set goals, short, intermediate, and long-term. As soon as you get there, you're just like trying to get busy, take care of patients. And despite everybody telling you like a thousand times, like, hey, man, you're going to get busy, chill out. This is the time to put in infrastructure, meet with your collaborators, like all of that. But if you have an inkling about what you're passionate about, or if you start developing ideas. So again, we, you know, for me, it was, I want to create a testis cancer program, a 360 degree comprehensive, basic translational clinical trials. And I was actually forced a bit. I was lucky to get a nice intramural grant and we'd have annual progress reports and they would have questions about basically what have you done? So early on, I was kind of forced to say, we've opened three clinical trials. Previously, there was zero. We've published five papers in testis cancer over the last six months. Previously, there was zero. Next thing, we've successfully competed for funding. Our lab has grown to two postdocs and a tech. And I mean, in your case, it's conceivable that in two years, Fox Chase has gone from doing six IPPs over the least previous two years to 100 over the previous three years. But it's not a foregone conclusion that somebody's going to know and appreciate that unless you make it visible. That's right. So maybe talk a little bit, of Jay, about tactful visibility, self-promotion, goal planning, measurables, deliverables. So you can say, hey, Dr. Uzo, I think I was a good hire because our prosthetic volume has gone from 2% market share to 
22% market share. Yes. I think the whole idea of sort of visibility, in some ways it's recognition, right? That you're, you're sort of talking about because your recognition then continues to fuel your passion, right? A little bit, right? If you're recognized for doing building testes cancer, hopefully you'll get more and more sort of patients that you could help because of the recognition that you've built a testes cancer program. I agree with that. I recognize it and agree with it. So I think there are ways to do it. There are ways to be tactful. And I'm not one to say that I always did it the right way. Totally. I'm not the one to say that. But I think there are certain things that I did that I maybe out of just sheer luck, I was I was okay with. You know, I think there's a, a whole list of things that I could, you know, sort of just quickly sort of list off. I think, you know, on on one level, I'll also add the caveat that the world is a little different now than it was when we were in training together in that there's so much more social media now, number one. There's so much more sort of websites. People build websites. They integrate it within their EMR even. They put it on their business cards, those kinds of things. So I think all of that helps. Like I have like a little personal website that one of your previous podcast guests, Dave Keynes, built WellPrepped. You know, WellPrepped's fantastic patient education tool. And, you know, I think Dave's done a great job with that. I use it. Same, me too. It's incredible. It's amazing, right? And so referring blows doctors my mind. now. Yeah, blows my mind. Re referring doctors get like my QR code now, you know, on every EMR letter that I send to people. My patients get it on discharge. My patients get it before they come to the office. So that's one way, a word of mouth thing. That's today. That's a new age thing that I didn't have when I first started. When I first started, though, it's really the simple things. You know, I would be in touch with the referring doctors. I was very, I thought I was very good at updating the referring doctor. And certain referring doctors, you know, you just get a sense talking to people, just want to get a letter and don't want to be bothered. However, a lot of referring doctors really care more than the letter. They w would appreciate a text message, I think, or some of them just want a quick phone call. You know, if it's a really complex case, you know, I would call people, I would text them, I would say, hey, give me a ring when you had a chance, you know, and I can tell you what I thought about such and such. Or I'll text them after the surgery and I'll be like, hey, you know, like for an ileal ureter, we just did an ileal ureter the other day. You know, I, I was in touch with the referring doctor. They put a lot of trust in you to take care of their patient, especially when you're doing something more complex. I never have taken that for granted. At least I've, I want to say that I've never taken it for granted. And so, that referring physician then tells other people about you. It's really they then shamelessly promote you. I think that's a huge way. I think, again, in the hospital, we always notice this, at least I noticed this in training. You know, when you're going through, the nurses and the OR techs are often talking about your attending while you're in the room alone, closing or waiting for the patient to wake up. And I've always felt that trying to really impress upon those people your value goes so far because it's sort of like when you start off as an intern, I tell the interns, no one ever tells you this. This is what I tell the interns. I'm like, no one ever tells you this. But when you're in medical school and you were a fourth year sub-I and you left for the day, no one knows this. You don't know this, but everyone was actually just talking about you when you left. And when you're an intern, you won't get this. You think you're actually working super hard because you are. But when you leave, believe it or not, everyone's talking about you again when you're an intern. And I, I tell the interns this all the time. And I'm like, in those first two to three months, a label forms for everyone. And in urology, as I had sort of started off, you know, when we were chatting, in urology, most people have a really positive label because we're just seen as really the cream of the crop kind of field. But that type of label forming, positive or negative, happens in your attending too. And it happens with the nurses, the techs, your staff, the office. And so when you ask, like, how do you sort of promote that you have this testes cancer program or that we do penile implants or urethral reconstruction, it's all of those things. It's sort of being in touch with the referring doctors, making sure that you're always available to them, texting and or email and or phone call. It's being available to the nurses in the OR. It's being available to the nurses on the floor. And 
the easiest way, you know, I think when I first started, especially in the in the kind of environment that I described where they just didn't have a lot of reconstructive or prosthetic sort of experience was I gave a lot of talks. So I gave a lot of nursing education talks, nurses presentations. I gave grand rounds. I went and met with every department chair in our hospital and asked if I could give grand rounds. They love it because now I know as I'm on the different side of this where we're just happy if people want to talk, you know, in the department. But you know how that is, right? Where people are just happy that they're speakers. But, you know, the medicine people, endocrinology, cardiology, trauma surgery, OBGYN, I gave talks to all of them. And so how do you sort of then, that's all building brain, right? And, and so there's websites today, which I think are helpful, like Dave Kane's, you know, is ahead of the curve. But then there's this other stuff, which is just sort of simple, I would say, grinding it out. You got to grind it out a little bit and just sort of put your nose to the ground, work on these types of things. I mean, you're so right when you first started, Vitya, about how you got to work on your foundations and, you know, I hate to say it, create dot phrases, for example, in the EMR, create your templates, because if you don't do it, then you're never going to really put the time or have the time to sort of do it. So I hope I've answered it. It's, it's like various things, I think, really have to come together for you to build your brand and for others to recognize that that's your skill set, that that's in your sort of wheelhouse. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. and. You know, of course, it's easier for us to talk about academics since that's how we've kind of structured our life. But clearly that translates to practice. I mean, probably even more so. And, you know, it may just be instead of referring urologists now really kind of creating that network among referring providers and understanding, again, like not being a passive bystander in your own life, like go to the department where the referral is coming from, who are my high volume referrers, being in touch with them, making sure that sure that they know that you're available and so forth. But then on the academic side, it's kind of a mind shift to go from being a trainee to being an expert. Absolutely. One day you go from, you feel good, you've studied, you've worked hard, you've learned, you've combed the literature and you come out and you're like, I can have a ultra educated conversation about IPPs and AUSs and payronies and trauma and so on and so forth. For me, it's, you know, about GU oncology. And I think, again, kind of sticking to academics, like conveying that to not in a clinical realm, but also as a, you know, in the academic realm, whether that's teaching or research or administration, like I'm an expert here and getting involved in societies, being visible at Grand Rounds, for instance, getting involved in resident and fellow education, and then being able to share that with the leadership, ultimately. Your chairperson is an ally. And if it's not proactive from their end, you know, once a quarter, once uh, six months, hey, can we meet and just talk about what I've been up to? You know, we've submitted eight abstracts or three papers and so on. I'm on this hospital committee and our QI, we've decreased prosthetic infection rates by 4%. I mean, because if you're, you can be doing a ton of super useful work, but if nobody knows about it, you're not given that value. Yeah, that's right. You're not valued for the full extent of what you, at least you think you've brought, you know, to that equation. I, I mean, I was thinking about it as you were saying it, you know, I, I couldn't agree more that when you first start, you're right, you've, especially in an academic environment, you know, which both of us can speak to a fair amount. You know, I think when you first start, you're such an expert because you've seen it all. At usually, you know, you've come from a fellowship. If you're joining an academic practice, perhaps many times you've come from a fellowship and that fellowship has had the volume requirements to meet fellowship standing. So you're at a referral center. Do you know what I mean? If you're finished a fellowship and you're sort of starting your job, and invariably, you know, I can relate this some to my own world of urethral and or prosthetic. You join a department where, you know, I did a fellowship perhaps, you know, where we did a lot of urethral reconstruction. You were there. We, we did a lot of these surgeries. We participated together. And you join a practice where you may have a partner, maybe someone, you know, who had different backgrounds where they have a lot of people doing self-catheterization for strictures. Or they have a lot of people doing dilation every three to six months on the same person. 
And there are ways to go about being the expert in urethral reconstruction, but not certainly not lecturing to that urologist on how they're managing it. And certainly trying to still, though, show value such that they feel comfortable in you participating in the care of their patient. So what I would say to it is, is there requires sort of a certain level of tactfulness, frankly, to show that you're an expert then to your peers. So I totally agree with you that, you know, meeting with your chair and or mentors often every, you know, several months, you know, to ask for direction and help, I think is helpful if you have an on-site mentor, but also not alienating yourself to say that, you know, listen, I'm the urethra expert. You're really mismanaging that guy's urethra. That gets you no favors <laughs> whatsoever. That gets you no favors. And I could imagine in testes, I'm a little out of my lane, but I could imagine in testes sort of the indication to do primary RPLND versus not versus, you know, whatever the treatment might be, that might be managed a certain way. And if you have opinions on how that could be different, whether it's academically backed or not, there are people that could take offense if you don't do it tactfully. So my suggestion would be to sort of just be very measured and tactful in those right as you get out of the gate. Yeah. I mean, it seems like kind of one of those, I mean, I don't think anything that we're saying is like groundbreaking, but sometimes it is nice to just kind of verbalize it. And it's a balance, right? I mean, you, you want to, you've also got to do the right thing. If you're an expert that you do understand the state of affairs and you know what the gold standard is, you know, it's kind of incumbent on us to share that, to teach that to residents and fellows and, and you know, make sure our, our patients are kind of benefiting but I think it's a dynamic process where you get in and I mean, I, I still think back to those first days, it was just like, just terror. You know, you didn't want to hurt somebody. You didn't want to, you didn't want to mismanage anything. Things were out of your control. You don't know how this operation goes in your own hands. And then you kind of settle in and, you know, many times the clinical and operative parts of it become a bit more routine, but it's those first impressions. It's coming in and being a team player and not the most vocal person at m and that's just jumping down everybody's throats for every little complication. That's also not going to get you any favors and all of our times come. So I think, I mean, clinically, I think you've really touched on some of the critical bits and your career to me has been a, a pretty accelerated administrative path, if I may. Early on, you went from joining the group to vice chair and now professor and in the near future, kind of heading up benign segments. Maybe just talk a little bit about what all transpired that Jay of an amazing group kind of stood out and had this awesome early career. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've, I've thought about it. I, I have been very, very, very fortunate. You know, I... I say this to everyone, I'm lucky. And you had mentioned it earlier, you know, Rob Uzo trained me as a resident. I left uh, and we were, you know, together in Dallas. And then I came back, Alex Kudikoff. As a resident, I got to participate with Rob as my attending, Alex as my fellow. There was another Mark Smaldone, another person who was a fellow when I was a resident, who's fantastic. Dave Chen was a young attending at the time. Leah Viterbo, young attending at the time. Various people were so crucial in my life. I love all of them so, so much that I then join and as sort of the junior partner. And, you know, I think probably the most important thing that sort of started me along the path was those people, some I've mentioned, many I haven't, but all of them I remember and think of often, really trusted me to sort of manage things administratively and or, you know, be organized at managing the clinics or the practice or the operations or, you know, the various things. So as you were saying, you know, when I would meet with Dr. Uzo periodically, he saw that I try to really understand how the clinic worked, for example, and not just for me, but for my partners and how their clinics worked. And I would try to steal the ideas, you know, if it didn't work for them, then I would be like, great, we don't need to do it that way. But if it did work for them, like anything, I wanted to be successful in my own clinic. And as I tried to learn, you know, the operations of the clinics, I think he really paid attention to that. And soon I was sort of tasked with operationalizing all the clinics. And so I would, you know, really 
play a role in all the hiring and the management of all the staff that came through the clinics, that was like one of the first things that was like tasked to me when I first sort of in my first several years. And then, you know, we were just lucky enough to have the right people and our team and our success sort of in the outpatient clinics. And then my career and my surgical successes in the OR with the volumes and sort of what I had was able to try to corral together in reconstructive urology just sort of put me in this path of being the vice chair. And so that's how that happened was, you know, I was paying attention really to everyone's sort of clinics and or practice, not because I was that guy that was lurking into their practice. I was more just trying to be successful for myself. I was trying to learn how these people that I looked up to so, so much were just so successful. And a lot of it is stuff we've already talked about. The stuff about the referring physicians and or how they conducted themselves was just something that, frankly, I just had to emulate, you know, because I had so many people there that were so good at that. And I still do. Yeah. I mean, a couple of things that just struck me as you were talking is, you know, of course, there's formal and there's informal FaceTime with various administrators. When it's formal, you ought to be prepared. I think it's their valuable time. It's your valuable time. And, you know, whenever I have a meeting that's not necessarily ultra structured, I try to have talking points, ideas, solutions, problems, whatever kind of laid out. If you're just in there like fiddling, I feel like that's different. You know, if you're going to join committees or take roles or do whatever, Hopefully you have some interest and passion. You know, life's too short and our academic careers are too short to say yes to stuff that you're totally not interested in. But if you do say yes, and especially if it's coming from somebody that you respect, you better show up. You know, this goes back to like medical school. If you're going to involve yourself in a research project, don't spread yourself thin. It's better to say no than not to do a good job and so forth. No, you got to be dialed in. You got to be dialed in. I agree with that. That's great advice. You have to be dialed in. And if you're not committed, people are paying attention. And, and, and that's not, you know, not a threat or anything. It's just more that that goes back to building your own culture and how you sort of run out of the gates is you have to show your passion. And so then don't take the responsibility. To your point, don't volunteer your effort if it's not in your sort of wheelhouse of being a part of that committee, for example. Yeah. Or, I mean, I do think education is changing, departments are changing, and of course there is this push and pull between obligations and work-life balance. And this isn't like 100 years ago where you had to say yes to everything just because it was floated across your desk. If the passion's not there, if the interest is not there, if the time's not there to do a good job, and that could be a departmental administrative task or ask, it could be institutional, it could be sectional, it could be AUA level, you know, whatever it may be, you know, I think just kind of take a good, good look at it. And is this important to me? Is this going to get me where I'm going? Do I care about it? And if not, I think most people would be very understanding and prefer if you are candid with them about how you feel about something. Totally. And, and one other thing that you had said sort of struck me was when you were talking about sort of meeting with an administrator and how you sort of have to be ready you know, for this meeting with administrators. So I was telling you earlier, you know, so Rob Uzo now is CEO of the Cancer Center at Fox Chase. And he said this to me when I was a resident and it stood with me. It still stays with me to this day. And he's not wrong. And I'll tell you what he told me. He gave me a, a quick sort of story. I remember we were at an AUA sort of at a bar and he told me this while we were just getting a drink. And he said, he's like, listen, you know, part of being in urology, part of being one of these surgeon leaders is invariably, whether as an attending, people are going to come to you with a problem. Most every day when you're at work, people are always coming to you with a version of a problem, a problem with your patient, a problem with the staff, some version of a problem. And, you know, when you meet with your boss and he didn't know that I was going to then be with him, you know, I had it was not a fait accompli that I would come back to Philadelphia. I wanted to look around, et cetera, et cetera. And it just made sense to come back. But before I remember him saying to me, he's like, people come to me 
with problems all the time. And that's okay, because that's why I'm here is to sort of hear about people's problems and try to get them better. But I will say that it's very uncommon for someone at the physician level to come to me with a problem and also present a solution. So just think about that was what he would say to me. And he would say, he would say, listen, I don't necessarily need to go with your solution, but the fact that you're offering a solution probably puts you a step ahead of a lot of other people that have come to me before you. And so I've always taken that. So to get to your point about how do you sort of climb administratively is I've always tried to look for the solution. And I've always tried to think about them before I've sat in that administrator's office and tried to present them with a solution. And sometimes they go with it. Actually, and over time, they will go with your solution more often. But in the beginning, I think they're just happy that you're thinking about the solution. And I think Rob was correct in that advice. And I've always tried to sort of follow through with that is look at the problems, try to come up with solutions. And to your point about going to an administrator, if you're going to meet with one, try to just think through the solutions and try to have some proposed solutions ready that they may entertain and they might not, but that's okay too. Yeah. Really, really great point. So, you know, coming up with a lot of problems without solutions, I think another word for that is complaining. That's correct. (laughs) And that can actually become contagious and lead to cultural impact and really change the whole dynamics of a department. I mean, I've seen iterations of this where it can quickly become... Oh, it snowballs. There's a problem with our salary structure. There's a problem with the fact that the oncology group's doing this and the benign's doing this. There's a problem I can't get cases on. There's a problem. And then it just kind of drags everybody down. But when you have solutions, and certainly when they're team-based solutions, that's a win. And I think celebrating and recognizing the contributions of the team to solve the problem is what creates a positive culture. And I've seen it. I've been very, very happy and lucky to see a solution-based culture in Dallas and a solution-based culture here at UCSD. I mean, you know, there's a lot of parallels. Chris Kane, CEO of the hospital system, where you meet him. I don't know if you know him. He's not a Debbie Downer complainer. He's like, what's the problem? Let's figure out a solution. So I think that's very, very important. And, and you've got to be careful to make sure that whatever your role is, I mean, first and foremost, that you're not a part of that complain culture and that even better that you could be a part of the solution culture, celebrating each other culture and everybody in the team, whether that's a nurse or an administrator or front desk staff that's contributing, get celebrated. Listen, I 100% agree. And I'll tell you, you know, it was different. You know, training has evolved in, I think, in, in a, a lot of positive ways. And, you know, you're right, work-life balance, various things are just very different now than even a decade or a little over a decade ago. And I remember when I was in training, you know, as a resident in Philadelphia, the residents, at least in Philadelphia, we had this unique problem where we would complain about things, right? The residents would complain about things. And I'm not saying that it would ever happen in any other program than the one that I was in at the time I was training. But I remember when the junior residents, and I was a junior resident at the time, complained about something. I couldn't remember what. I just remember the senior resident sort of listened to that and just looks at one of my peers and says, nobody likes a complainer. Don't complain. Let's figure it out. But don't complain. Nobody likes a complainer. And I just remember hearing that. And and I just remembered Rob's advice, Uzo's advice to me. And I've always tried to think through the solution. I've always tried to think it through. And I think administratively, that has helped me. I think it really has, is is just paying attention to the problems and trying to sort of build your consolidation, whether, like you just said, you know, the team needs to then subscribe to your solution, right? If you have a solution and you have to be seen as someone that they would trust in that solution, and hopefully, at least for me, that that wasn't as hard because I entered an environment where a lot of the people knew me. But still, you know, they don't know you as this person who can solve the problem. You know, you have to still gain their trust that you can solve the problem. Yeah, I think it's all of those things, I think. And then the chair has to buy into your solution as well, you know, in, in some of these sort of academic based departments. But I couldn't agree more that complaining becomes contagious 
and it ends up being not productive. And frankly, it brings the morale of the entire unit down if you sort of fall into that vortex. Absolutely. Well, Jay, I've certainly learned a lot and it's been kind of fun reflecting about mostly things that I could have done a boatload better and then maybe a few things that somewhat worked out. But I want to be respectful of your time and our listenership's time. Any any kind of parting thoughts as we come upon an hour? Well, I think, you know, I someone had told me about this, you know, when we were just talking in conversation. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, when Aditya and I were talking about this, when both of us were talking about this, we had talked about sort of, you know, showing value in your first job. And I would also just to close would say, you know, in, in urology and, and just in life and, and medicine in general, you don't always get it right, right? You sort of pick a job and I've, I've sort of seen various scenarios and not necessarily yours or mine. You know, I think we've been very happy with how we sort of started, you know, our careers. But I've also met along the way various people who they just weren't happy in their first position. They just weren't. And there are various reasons to that. Some might have to do with family, geography. Some might have to do with the level of support they felt they weren't getting in that job. It might have to do with a combination of those things. But usually it's one of those two things, you know, the level of support and or the trouble perhaps that their family has in that area and or lack of family support outside of the current position. And I would say that that's okay. You know, like we, we you know, I, I, people sort of really want to be successful. We've, we've really, in urology, we've asked for success and urologists are successful, but they sort of look at maybe getting out of the stumbling blocks a little bit. And if they have sort of a family issue and, or if they have like a support issue in their first position and they need to sort of course correct a little bit and they have to switch out, that's okay. Like, I don't think, I don't see any of that ever as a sign of quote unquote failure and, or I never sort of have seen that as a problem. I've always seen that frankly, as an experience. And so many of my sort of colleagues, friends, I've sort of seen it some, you know, in Philadelphia, some in our own team where people, you know, have sort of moved for various reasons to another position. I think that's okay. I, I don't know what your thoughts are on it. I mean, both of us can sort of speak that both of us have shifted, you know, our positions from when we first started right out of fellowship. I've always seen it as, you know, moving on sometimes is necessary, sometimes for various reasons. And that's okay too. I don't know. What do you think, Aditya? Yeah. I mean, you know, I had a wonderful practice, wonderful job and post pandemic, all my family moved out to Southern California, had to make some tough decisions and decided to move and wholeheartedly agree. I mean, it's a, you know, we're dynamic people. And I think ultimately, you know, when it's, when it's winding down, if you reflect and you stayed in a medium situation because it was convenient versus rock the boat and it, it's not easy. I mean, you know, upping and moving your family, your kids, whatever it may be is, is not challenging, but I absolutely, you know, I mean, it's again, if you're a positive person, if you're heart's in the right place. I, I think it doesn't really matter where you are and what you're doing. You're going to be able to bring value and enjoy the experience. And just periodically sitting down, reflecting and assessing instead of just passively going through your life. And next thing you know, you're retired and you're like, well, that's what happened. I don't think anybody would, would love that, but I, absolutely. I mean, there are jobs that mandate changes at certain intervals to keep it fresh. But there's maybe this sense that in medicine, a change is somehow a betrayal to your patients and to your partners and whatever institution. I think that's, uh, you know, if people kind of understand why you're doing what you're going to have to do, most people want you to just be happy. That's right. I couldn't agree more. And this idea, this sort of, I think that's an older school idea of it being a betrayal of you leaving your unit, your patients, your relationships per se. I don't think that's new age. You know, I think like we've evolved in training and, you know, sort of work-life balance, various things we've evolved in. I think this has already evolved and we need to sort of recognize it, embrace it, and, you know, when necessary, adopt it. I love it. Jay, 
always a pleasure. You know, thanks again for your insight and congratulations on a, you know, smoking hot start there in Philly and excited to see what the future brings. Thanks so much for having me. This is fantastic. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at underscore Backtable on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable is hosted by Aditya Bagrodia and Jose Silva. Our audio team lead is Kieran Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Ishan Sangwan and Vedavi Padwardhan. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.